What is grace? Grace is community. Grace is passion. Grace is for everyone. Today we welcome the Reverend Eunice Vega Perez. Eunice is the district superintendent of the Skylands District and oversees our church along with about 90 other churches. So she is a very busy woman, but we're very grateful to have her here today with us. She has served in Butler, Trinity, Vernon, and Bishop Jane's United Methodist Churches. Uh, Eunice and I met many years ago. Uh, I'm not sure she remembers it, but it, uh, it was at my church at an international festival, an uh, international celebration. Uh, and it was an absolute feast. And I remember thinking, everyone always says that Methodists love to eat. And they proved it at that international festival for sure. Uh, uh, she does remember. All right, all right. Uh, and uh, it was a delight, and I'm grateful that our paths cross again as she oversees ministry here at Grace. Uh, and Eunice was supposed to preach here back in January, but between COVID and a snowstorm, it didn't happen. So it was rescheduled today. And I'm, I'm grateful for that, especially because it gives an opportunity for the church to hear a female voice on Mother's Day, which I really appreciate. Uh, so I think that's important. Eunice is going to share with us an encouraging message taken from the text of Matthew chapter 5. And I want to invite Kelly to come up and read our scripture for today. It's a short one, uh, so listen carefully as we hear Jesus right after the Beatitudes tell his followers that we are salt and light. Uh, let's hear it now uh, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Hear now the word of the Lord. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you welcome now with me the Reverend Eunice Vega Perez? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hopefully you had some breakfast. If not, you know, in my tradition, if you don't answer back to me, I will be saying it again and again. <laughs> so let's uh, do it one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Amen. It's so glad to be uh, in God's house. Uh, Brian, now I remember, and uh, I have to confess that I love to eat. And uh, we have a joke in my family. Uh, I'm 5'1", but I eat like a truck driver. <laughs> love to eat, uh, love to eat all kinds of food. Um, and it's just, you know, such a joy. Uh, but because I love to eat, uh, I have to exercise and uh, be a long-time member of Weight Watchers. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it is such a delight uh, to be here. Um, since uh, I came through the doors, I was greeted uh, with openness, joy. The greeters uh, do have done an amazing job. And you know, when somebody comes uh, for the first time, uh, the church has two chances for newcomers, new people to come back. The number one um, impression, it values like maybe 80%. So as they come, how they're greeted, how we uh, welcome them, it makes a huge difference. If they didn't feel it the first time, they might come twice and that's it. So we have within the first time, that they come, we have 80% um, to, to keep them, so it's very important. So I felt like a home, uh, it was a great greeting, so I just wanna uh, thank you um, for your hospitality. The other things, you know, it's so good to come as, uh, as a guest because, you know, you are able to observe a lot rather quickly. Um, I have to say, uh, for those of you who are trustees, uh, this church is Gorgeous. It's 
beautiful. I love to take pictures. So as I came in and I was like, oh, I love that window. I'm going to take a picture. Oh, I love that one. Uh, I'm going to be posing, uh, taking a picture and uh, love it. So clean, so beautiful. Uh, it tells me and it tells visitors that you care, that you care. And so uh, thank you so much. The first thing uh, when I came that I also noticed was uh, the praise band. Young adults, and we're going to stretch it after 37, young adults. <laughs> so it is so good to see younger generation uh, praising God and be faithful in the life of the church. Don't take that for granted. And so as they come, as their, these servants come and, and worship and praise and rehearse every Sunday and perhaps throughout the week, just be, um, make sure that once in a while you give thanks to them for the faithfulness uh, and their ministry. Uh, I also noticed that uh, the pastor's kids were here half an hour before. Uh, you know, it's hard to be a PK, a preacher's kid. I was one, and they dragged me an hour before worship, and then it, it's a lot on the uh, uh, pastor's kids. So when you see the pastor's kids, just thank them. They're, they're uh, here, and they, go, they have to go beyond. Uh, pastor's wife, uh, it's not a given that a pastor's wife is gonna be uh, involved in the ministries of the church. So also uh, give thanks uh, and also talk to the pastor's wife and said, thank you for, for your ministry. It's hard for a clergy couple with young children uh, to be uh, in ministry. I really enjoy uh, when um, couple, I think was the, the reader this morning, uh, they came and the children came out of the car and, and they were running and they just went to, to, the, to their Sunday school. It's hard to get children out of bed on a Sunday morning and excited to come to church. And uh, so these young, uh, parents with younger children, you know, it takes harder to come to church. You know, me, I got up, you know, tried to do my beauty stuff, uh, sat down on a chair to have breakfast. But when I had small children, it was hard because I, only, I not only had to, you know, get dressed and get my stuff ready, but also get my children ready. And sometimes they're not in a good mood to come. They don't want to come. Um, and so it's also a hard work and parents have to be intentional. So thank you for those of you who have children who have youth and come and try to do your best to come and to bring your children and to instruct them in the way of the Lord. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it is a joy, it is a joy uh, to be here. Uh, I bring greetings from uh, Bishop Scholl from the cabinet and I give thanks to God for your faithfulness and for all the things that you're doing in God's name. I also notice uh, that the, pa the screen, the PowerPoint, whatever you have, is amazing and it rocked. I love how the sons have the words roll over. You know, it's not a static, um, you know, PowerPoint. You know, I notice all these things because I have been in a lot of churches. Uh, so whoever put that together, you rock. For the person that is upstairs doing the sound and uh, goes to the, comes to the church an hour before, whoever are up there, you rock in the name of Jesus. It takes a village. It takes a village to be the church. It takes a village, so many, uh, to, um, to do Sunday worship. Uh, Pastor Brian, your prayer rocked. And I mean, it's one of the most complete prayers for, for Mother's Day, so I might steal it. <laughs> I put it on my Facebook page. Anyway, so uh, let us bow our head uh, and have a word of prayer. May the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth be acceptable to you, O oh God. We pray all this in the beautiful name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Friends, the Gospel of Matthew was the first canonical gospel written around 80 to 90 common era. This book was exceptionally and skillfully written as a teaching tool for the emerging Christian community comprised with both Gentiles and Jews. This community was experiencing social 
and religious tensions because they were advocating for a new way, the way of Jesus as the savior of the world. These disciples were committed to evangelism mission and they were inviting people to believe and follow Jesus, the savior, the person, the incarnated birth. So as you can only imagine, this proclamation was not easy to digest in the heart and mind of those receiving it. And as a result, people were hostile towards them. I personally believe that the Gospel of Matthew continues to teach us through the power of the Holy Spirit to be better Christians and disciples uh, to be courageous in our witness and evangelism in the 21st century, 2022. But more importantly, uh, it teaches us how the church, how to be the church in a broken world. Have you ever experienced antagonism because of your faith and your witness? If you have not faced opposition because of your faith, give God thanks and continue with your witness, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ with words and with action. But if you have experienced aversion, uh, praise God, because the scripture tell us, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Well, I mean, when I was reading this text, I said, well, Jesus, the gospel according to Eunice said, if they are, um, they could persecute me, uh, but insult, I'm not sure if I might take an insult in a good way. <laughs> But that's what the scripture says. If you have been persecuted, um, just share with other uh, Christians and, and leaders as a testimony, as a testimony uh, to share how this difficult experience has transformed your faith and have made you a better, stronger Christian leader. And so let us go back to the scripture reading of this morning. In chapter five, right after the Beatitudes, Jesus' teachings styled change. He used some images in order to describe qualities, attributes worthy of uh, his devote, devotees and disciples. Friends, today these illustrations are good for us as well. They continue to invite us into a life of discipleship and witness, faith and action. In verses 13 through 16, Jesus used the images of salt and light. Jesus said, you, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. You see, kingdom people have the responsibility to be salt and light in our places of ministries, like the community where our church is located. And if you don't live in this community, you have the responsibility to be salt and earth in the, time, in the town that you reside. We need to be salt and light in our places of work, our school and where we go, at the grocery store, everywhere we go. So let us unpack these images of salt and light. Let us begin with salt. Salt has many meanings in scriptures, both Old Testament and the New Testament. Let me share a few of them. In the Old Testament, salt was tied to religious sacrifice. Leviticus chapter two, verse 13 reads, 
Season all your grain offering with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your, go of your God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to all your offerings. Salt was a preservative per excellence in antiquity. And so it makes sense that Jesus used the imagery of salt to tell the disciples and all the people who follow him uh, to be God's, to per, um, the per, per durability of God's covenant. Salt was linked with loyalty and covenant fidelity. Numbers chapter 18 verses 19 says, whatever is set aside from the holy offerings, the Israelites present to the Lord. I give to you and your sons and daughters as you regular share, it is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord for you and for your offspring. Another uh, meaning uh, of salt in the Old Testament was purification. Second Kings chapter two, verse 19 reads, now the people of the city said to Elijah, the location of the city is good as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. He said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went to the spring of water and threw salt into it and said, thus says the Lord, I have made this water wholesome. Salt was also seen as a necessity of life because of, of its seasoning and preservative qualities. It was used to preserve food like meat and fish. It was one of the most highly prized minerals. We can use the same meanings of salt. Um, salt bring taste, purity, and uh, preservation, and to say uh, they bring those qualities to kingdom people. And we are expected to be the same. Number one, purity. We are called to be like Christ-like, to move into perfection and sanctification as John Wesley proclaimed and teached us. Number two, taste. The world needs something different. The flavors of the world are hate, envy, violence, destruction, discrimination, and many others. We are called to something different. Number three, preservation. We are expected to preserve God's word, teaching for this generation and the ones to come. To preserve Jesus' teaching is to love, to be peacemakers, to love mercy and be merciful towards others, to help the least of thee, to treat them fairly and with dignity. And to know that in God's eyes, they are equal and have the same value and right before God Almighty. We are all created equal. It is society that see us as less. Friends, not only uh, these are Jesus' teachings, but they are also an expectation uh, and a huge responsibility for each one of us. If you and I don't do the work of Christ, who will? Who will? Jesus told those who wanted to follow him, you are the soul of the earth. But if salt, salt doesn't lose its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. How can we be salty disciples? So the salty disciples are the ones who defend truth and justice where they are. There are those who move and bat and bat Ooh, advance 
God's kingdom of love, fairness, justice, mercy, forgiveness, advocacy, equality, and equity. And if this is true, I have two questions for you this morning, and also for myself. Are you a salty disciple? If yes, think about some of concrete examples. If you're not, if I'm not, God give us the opportunity every single day to do better, to get closer to the heart of God, and that's what we called God's grace. And if salt gives flavor to food, then salty disciples should give a new flavor to the community and to the world. If we don't, the Bible is clear. We don't do any good. Our faith has no action, and more than that, no weight or testimony to those around us. Here in the Skyland District of what we former called the Palisade District, salty disciples, both clergy and laity, held a prayer service both in person and online last Sunday to pray for the peace of Ukraine. We also collected a special offering of $1,200 to send to Ukraine through AMCOR. Whoop, I lost my page. <laughs> there we go. All right. <laughs> there we go, there we go. All right, back in 2020, we hold a prayer vigil when George Floyd was killed. And not only we prayed out and many of us protest and participate, participated in marches denouncing racism and abuse. We hold a prayer service when the mass shooting happened in Atlanta last March, where many Asians were killed. We condemn Asian hate. We pray for the families, for the town. We pray for the state and nation. We protested against gun violence and racism. We ask God for courage so that we can be agents of change in our communities. We also hold a prayer vigil in January 2021 when the insurrection happened at Capitol Hill. And we planned that in less than three hours and 150 disciples show up through Zoom. Colossians 4, 6 says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer to everyone. Brothers and sisters in Christ, salty disciples are those who make a difference in the lives of their family, friends, community, and the world. But there's also one more meaning as salt, uh, related to salt, and that is sharing of salt. In the Bible, salt was also associated with binding uh, relationship. One of the greatest gifts of a community of faith is that we share our belief in Christ, we nurture one another, and we share life experiences. We grow together, share our highs and our lows, and support one another. The love of Christ binds us together, and this love moves us to act and to make a difference. In early September, Central Jersey was hit by a tornado and heavy rain. It flooded and destroyed many houses, building including some of our churches. G&J disciples stretch out their hands to help these churches by working in the actual site uh, and also with offerings, finances as well. Here in the Palisades Skyland District, we had a pastor who fell down uh, taking water out from the church basement. And as a result, he had a bad concussion. Another clergy person helped this pastor to fill out claims, help him with, uh, to call um, the insurance, pull the claim and accompany him through this painful experience and process. And not only that, he preached for him because he really was in bad shape for two Sundays so he could rest and recovery. The second imagery from the Gospel of Matthew is light. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do the light, a light, uh, 
they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but put into a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Light, my friend, has been a symbol of divine presence from the beginning of times and throughout the ages. Light is described as a form of energy that is always moving. The purpose of light is to shine in the darkness, reducing fear and enabling people to find their way. In chapter four of Matthew uh, 16, Jesus introduced uh, us the one who is the light of the world. Light, my friend, is seen uh, and so light is to be seen and so we Christians are called to be seen and reflect the light of Christ just where we are. Light bearing Christians bring hope in the darkness. We help others to see God in places and circumstances that are extremely difficult. And in other words, put your light on its stand. Your circumstances are an opportunity to shine brightly for the Lord. Light bearing disciples expose the darkness, the evil forces of wickedness, of injustice, of oppression, and hate. In the town of Butler, where I first served, there was a lot of wickedness and evil people that were harming the Latino community that was coming into town. People were overly racist. They even throw beer bottles to Latino people that were walking on the street. You know what, even they threw uh, beer bottles to my daughters that were like 12 years old. And let me tell you, I was not a happy camper. They threw beer bottles to those who were um, not uh, walking and they also scream out nasty things like go back to Mexico, this is not your country. And so the clergy got together and started to advocate these injustices by talking to the mayor, by talking to the police. We went to the town council and, and stood up and say and made statements. We wrote articles in the newspaper. You see, light is bright. It, it dispels darkness. It enables people to see what they're doing and you can paint a new picture of how things can be. I don't know about you, but I'm also sad about what is happening in our country. Hey, discrimination, racism, uh, racism, violence, sexism is rampant. And so this is our task, brothers and sisters in Christ, to bring light in those dark places in our culture and in our society, to bring light and expel the darkness that are hurting so many children of God. And you are the light. You and I are to call to make a difference in our respective communities. And that's what the church is all about. This is not a choice, my friends, this is a command. You see people out there see our light and our saltiness. And so they are curious and perhaps have the desire to experience uh, God by our testimony. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you, you, disciples of Wyckoff United Methodist Church, Grace United Methodist Church, in this town, are salt and light in this community and beyond. You continue to support families who have lost loved ones through funeral service, pastoral care, and your congregational care team does an amazing job, a ministry of grace, compassion, prayer, and mercy. Thanks be to the Lord. Your soup ministry is another example of your light and saltiness by delivering soup to those who are in need. Four times a year, and I heard the pastor said that you serve about 150 people who are homeless through Family Promise, making a big fit beef dinner and all the fixing. By the way, 
it comes out next time, next uh, week, May 15, you have what is called Change the World Sunday. On that day, you do something for Camp YDP in Patterson and other ministries. Isn't that amazing? First Peter 3.15 says, but in your heart, revere, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who ask you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Friends, the Apostle Paul said that faith without action is a dead faith. John Wesley, the founder of our denomination, also believed that Christians are to be called soul and light. So my friends, Jesus is calling us and challenging us this morning to live an active faith. Jesus invites us and challenges us to be and to model with our life and actions, both personally and as the church community, to surrender, to live out our kingdom values, goodness, love, fairness, peace, mercy, forgiveness, justice, equity, equality, compassion, justice. This week, I invite you to reflect on your own spiritual life, discipleship, and witness, both individually and as a church. What does it mean to reflect the light of Christ, of Jesus, in your neighborhood? What does it mean to be salt for your friends, for your community, and for the world? These questions will give you the opportunity not only to reflect in your own life and witness, but also will encourage to grow in your saltiness and in your light. God bless you. For everything happening at Grace, check out our website at gumc.org.